Hello, my name is Ian McCall and this is another of the consultations in dermatology from the Australian Institute of Dermatology. Today we're going to look at an unusual condition called pityriasis rubra pilaris. Now, it's an unusual name. The pityriasis refers to a small scale. The rubra means it's red. The pilaris means that uh, in some, uh, to some extent it's associated with hair follicles. Now, this isn't a common condition. It is a red scaly disease, so it's part of the uh, mnemonic PM's PET. And it's one of the P's at the beginning, the pityriasis ones. Now, this condition typically occurs in two age groups, either before the age of five or after the age of 50. You seldom see it uh, in between. And when it begins, it begins with a follicular papule with uh, a horny keratin center. Um, and again, it usually also begins with redness and some scaling in the scalp. Now, these keratotic papules can also be seen on the side of the neck and on the back of uh, some of the fingers. So let's have a, a little look at this particular image here. This is how it starts. Look at these small follicular papules. You see it best at the periphery here because ultimately the papules tend to merge together and you get a large sort of keratotic plaque. And over time, the keratotic, the keratotic nature gets less and so it becomes red and smooth. So if you think someone may have uh, keratos uh, have pityriasis rubra pilaris because of a bit of scale and redness in the scalp and you think it might be, is this psoriasis or is it a fungal infection or is it PRP? then go looking around the neck, look at the back of the hands and see if you can see any of these follicular based papules because that's the early marker. Now later on the patient tends to develop a lot more scale. The scale extends down onto the face so it begins on the scalp and it extends peripherally. And the tightening that you get on the scalp and under the eyelids here can give rise to an ectropion. Now you can see this occurring slightly in this gentleman here. He's unable to close his eyes properly. You can see the prominence of the lower part of the eyelid margin here. And that's a drawing down effect. Now looking at this scale, you would say that's very psoriatic scale. And sometimes, as I say, it's very difficult initially to say whether the patient has this pityriasis rubra pilaris condition or whether they have ordinary psoriasis. This is the same gentleman and you see it's extending onto the, the trunk here. Now again, it's red and scaly. If we were able to take a close-up here, you'd see that there were follicular papules in this and you don't get these sort of papules in psoriasis. This mentions a thing called islands of sparing. Now, we'll see this a bit better, I think, on this slide. Because you can see at this stage, a lot of the follicular papules have disappeared and it's become just a red, fairly smooth background. And these are the little islands of sparing, little areas of normal skin on this background of erythema. Now, when someone has skin that's as red as this, um, they're losing a lot of heat. Um, because, you, you know, it's an increased skin blood flow to give you skin as red as this. And so sometimes these patients actually get rigors or at least they start shaking just because they're having trouble maintaining their, uh, their temperature. Also, it's still often scaly. I mean, he's been putting a lot of moisturizer on here, so that's why it's looking um, the color it is. But uh, they can lose so much protein from the scale that uh, they can get hypoalbuminemia. Now, that's not common, but it certainly can occur. The skin often isn't terribly itchy in this disorder. Um, it can be a bit more sun sensitive. Sun can, uh, sun can make this worse. And this has an influence in terms of the treatment modalities that we might use. Because, you know, if this had been psoriasis, we would have been quite happy to use some narrowband UVB therapy. But you have to weigh up the pros and cons of that when you're treating pityriasis rubra pilaris. The cause of this disorder isn't known. Some patients have a reduction in uh, retinol binding protein in their blood, but not all. It has some, uh, the initial follicular lesions have some, some resemblance to vitamin A deficiency. 
but giving these patients um, high doses of vitamin A doesn't seem to, to make things better. Um, we said that there are uh, a variety of presentations of this. Um, Griffiths gave a classification in which I think he resolved the condition into about five different types. And that's the classic adult type, which is what I've really been showing you there just now. And the vast majority of these, 80% of them, will just resolve in three years, whether you're treating them with any systemic agent or not. But And the, there's also a classic juvenile type as well. And most of those will, in fact, resolve within one year. But then you've got an atypical adult type, and there are some atypical juvenile forms as well, which can be both generalized or localized. And those types, the atypical adult <clears throat> and those two juvenile forms, they account for about 35% of the total number of cases of PRP, and they won't resolve. And it really is a bit of a tragedy if you've got this, because your skin's red all over, you're peeling all the time, and you subsequently can go on and develop thick palms and soles. Now, uh, it's quite a marked keratoderma that you can, in fact, get here. You get the impression that that's occurring here, but he's well lubricated. Um, this picture, perhaps, <coughs> shows the more characteristic uh, palmar plantar keratoderma that you can uh, get in this condition. So the ectropion and the palmar palmar keratoderma are really highly specific features for this, as are these islands of sparing normal skin against this background of, uh, of erythema. These were just a couple of other pictures um, of, uh, of patients to show the generalized type with a lot of scaling. And this was, again, the lower parts of the legs of the erythrodermic type patient that I showed you before, where the skin smoothed out. You can still see little islands of sparing up here against this background of, uh, of erythema. This was just this gentleman's leg as well, <clears throat> a little bit more scaly in the lower leg, but again, these islands of sparing, fairly characteristic of Pteriasis rubra pilaris. I think the last uh, slide here is just another gentleman, but see the extensive ectropion that uh, that he in fact has. Um, and it can be quite a, an annoying problem to in fact have. As the condition resolves, and, and, and it often clears from the top down as well, as the condition resolves here, the ectropion will improve as well. Um, so we've said that atypical adult and atypical juvenile forms, accounting for 35% of cases, have a poorer prognosis. And in all cases of Pteriasis rubra pilaris, there appears to be sometimes associated hypothyroidism and even hypoparathyroidism, but only in a small proportion of cases. But it's worthwhile doing some checks for that. Some patients also get a sac sacroiliitis, pain in the lower back, and sometimes an autoimmune thyroiditis as well. So check uh, for thyroid autoantibodies. So what about the treatment of this condition? Well, certainly with all that redness and scaling, you want to moisturize. Not only it matters what you moisturize with, 10% urea cream uh, can be useful if you've got a lot of scale there, as can 10% um, lactic acid uh, as well. Don't be tempted to use a high concentration of salicylic acid uh, on the skin. It's a big area, and they may absorb enough salicylic acid to get uh, salicylism with uh, you know, tinnitus in the ears and other problems. Tacrolimus is a calcineurin inhibitor. It, it reduces the number of T cells that are in the skin. And whereas we don't think this is any type of autoimmune disease, topical tacrolimus does appear to have some benefit here. So there's inflammatory elements that it must help. You know, normally we think of topical steroids for most types of inflammation, but um, you know, they're not really very helpful. They don't reduce the erythema and scaling that much. The main thing is to reassure patients. Um, explain the nature of the condition to them. Watch the elderly, uh, especially if they get markedly erythrodermic. You know, they can have 60-70% um, you know, of cardiac output going to that red skin just for the blood supply. So it can even tip some of them into 
uh, a little bit of uh, cardiac failure. And also, if they lose a lot of scale and they get hypoalbuminemia, that reduces the hydrostatic pressure of the, or at least the osmotic pressure of plasma proteins in the blood. And so they don't reabsorb fluid from the uh, postcapillary areas, the postcapillary venules. And so they can get peripheral edema. So watch that. Um, what about systemic therapy? What can we use there? Well, isotretinoin and acetretin, you know, they're both vitamin A derivatives. It's interesting that, you know, vitamin A deficiency can look like this and then these vitamin A analogs are used in treatment. This is usually used in acne, but it can have a beneficial effect in PRP uh, as well. But we tend to use acetretin, um, you know, near Tigerson, 25 to 50 milligrams per day of that. Um, just have to go easy with it because it does make them very dry. Um, it can cause a lot of that palmar plantar keratoderma to disappear, though. Um, but again, they've got the moisturize and the skin will dry and crack very easily. Methotrexate is useful in pitoriasis rubriparis. Again, somewhere between 10 and 20 milligrams a day. Occasionally, we'll add in some retinoids as well. I don't do that a lot because, you know, the combination can really affect the liver. Um, so watch methotrexate and anyone who drinks too much alcohol and who's got any sort of impaired renal function. Um, and a lot of elderly patients, uh, you know, are on other drugs and uh, do have impaired uh, renal function. So you're just going to be careful with the introduction of those drugs. Narrowband UVB, you know, ultraviolet therapy. This is variable as far as the response goes. Um, Sometimes it seems to work a bit better with a low dose of an oral retinoid as well, you know, a bit of neotigus and their acetretin. Um, but some patients are made worse, so go slowly with it. Cyclosporin, again, much better in psoriasis and uh, atopic dermatitis. I haven't really found it um, of great use. And it's the same with um, azathioprine, you know, Imuran. It's also um, sometimes used in recalcitrant cases. But you've got to watch because you, you're mainly dealing with elderly people here. And you've just got to watch you don't make them worse. And remember, 80% of the adult type are going to get better within three years. So it's a case of trying to um, help people along to cope with the condition um, in the knowledge that there's an 8 out of 10 chance it will, in fact, improve. What about the biologics, you know, TNF-alpha inhibitors? Again, it has some anti-inflammatory effect. It does seem to help some cases. They're still very expensive drugs, these, and I don't have a lot of experience of using them in PRP because it's not, it's not officially indicated for that here in Australia. But there are some papers from overseas that say that it will work in some cases. And what about systemic steroids to reduce the inflammation? Well, Again, just as topical steroids aren't terribly useful, systemic steroids don't seem to make uh, an awful lot of difference as well. It can calm down short-term flares, but again, I, I, you know, you've just got to be careful in using it. Um, most patients will get better. Methotrexate is probably my, my drug of choice uh, with them, but consider acetretin and isotretinone as well. Plenty of moisturizers, a lot of reassurance. Um, and you hope that they're one of the 80% that will get better. Thank you very much.